Okay, great. Hi, Michelle. And hi, hi everyone else. Welcome back. It's nice to have you move from one space to another. Thank you for traveling with us on AirMeet. And um, I'm over to you, Michelle. Yes, thank you. So hello, everyone, again. Um, if you're moseying over with me from the last session, uh, last time we talked about the prepare model. Um, so in the interest of helping you retrieve some of that information and help solidify, uh, does anyone who joined the last session remember what prepare stands for? You can push that in the chat if you remember. Okay. Um, so for those of you who don't, the prepare, prepare model is something that I came up with. It's very much focused on prime, relevance, engage, practice, activate, reflect, and effort. Um, so these are different strategies, um, and there's a series of books that I'll share at the end of this session for you to reference, um, but really is focused on how do we make learning sticky from an overall standpoint. Um, so this session we're going to go through and really focus on what are those brain hacks. So brain hacks are very quick one to three minute exercises that you can do that can make it easier for your brain to start retrieving that information. Unfortunately, when we go to school, most of us were not taught how to learn. We were taught how to, uh, what to learn. Um, so we're stepping back a little bit and taking the opportunity to say, well, when we talk about lifelong learning, how do we do it in ways that work with our brain um, rather than in opposition with our brain? Because some things that we do that we think are very intuitive of, of course, you know, me reflecting and looking at my notes is a great way for me to study. Uh, research shows, though, that you don't remember very much when you just read back through notes that you took. Um, a better strategy, of course, is to take the time to think about, well, what did I take notes on? What were the three key points that I had? And be able to go through and look at it from that standpoint and then look at the content uh, once you've identified where those gaps exist. So the area that we're going to focus on up front is how do you set yourself up for success before you come into the learning? So um, when we think about brain hacks, answer these three questions for me in the chat. Pick one, do them all, whichever your preference is. But what do you know about the subject of brain hacks? Is there a brain hack that you like, that you find very useful? What things do you have questions about when it comes to brain hacks? So put some of those items here in the chat. Yep, the Pomodoro technique, absolutely. Nancy says, I know almost nothing on it. So we'll kind of clarify that, provide some books um, and items, yep. So Janet, the deliberate practice. Um, so that's a lot of the research in the book Peak um, and research by Bjork and Bjork. Um, leveraging many senses possible when learning, absolutely. So the more ties and connections you can make to that new information that you're learning, the more solidified that's going to be. Um, so priming your brain by asking questions is a very powerful technique. Um, other things that come into priming your brain are sometimes things that you do to remove other things that might be distracting. So turning off notifications, closing browsers, tabs, which I'm notoriously bad at, um, you know, setting, um, taking your Apple watch off or putting your watch on mute or do not disturb using focus in Microsoft. Um, all of those kind of things can help you really create that environment where you can really focus in and have that immersion that Paul Zach talked about when you're going through that process. Um, the relevance really gets into deeply connecting. So when we think about our learners, um, we really need to provide them both context and relevance. So, you know, if you're going through a major organization change, we're going to make ourselves a learning organization. We're going to adopt this new process. Um, you really got to cover, you know, that with them 
for people of what's in it for me? Why do I need to learn this? How is this going to help me? Um, you know, and that context of why is this important for us to do as an organization? What's kind of that surround? So I've made it personal for myself, but I still don't understand why it's important to everyone else or how it's going to be applied in the company. Um, those are things that can really help um, from an overall standpoint. From a human-centered design, um, you know, being able to anticipate those types of questions that you're going to have from learners can really help um, them from that standpoint. And then setting up some of these questions of why are you here? What do you want to learn? And setting up people for success from that standpoint can be very, very helpful. Yep, and Janet, you talked about long and short-term memory. So there's actually eight types of memory. Britt Andreata talks about this a lot. There's um, two types of short-term memory and six long-term memories, if I remember correctly. Um, but she talks through those a lot. Um, so short-term memory happens in your prefrontal cortex, so up here in the front of your brain. Um, there's only a limited number of things that can, ha uh, can live in your short-term memory before they kind of get pushed out. Um, so you want to engage in strategies that are moving that information from your prefrontal cortex into your hippocampus, which is where um, your memories live. Um, things that can interrupt that. So if you're coming to this session and you're like, oh my God, I hope we get done on time. I have a call that I need to get to, or I'm really worried about this presentation. Sign off now because that's going to be a challenge for you. You are not going to learn anything. Prefrontal cortex um, tires very, very quickly. Um, your your um, limbic system, where your fight, flight, and uh, freeze lives, um, that part of your brain does not go to sleep. So it's constantly going. So if you have high stress levels, if there's something that you're worried about, um, that will interrupt that learning process for you. So how do you engage in learning from an overall perspective? Um, so we talked about the removing distractions. Um, you can use the Pomodoro method. Um, so this is a couple of strategies. So Pomodoro is, uh, stands for tomato in uh, Italian. Um, my little Pomodoro is a little kitty and mouse that my kids got me. Um, but when you start out, um, start low. It can be five minutes. It can be 10 minutes. It does not have to be 25 minutes, um, which is what the Pomodoro method recommends. Um, so it can be any amount of time. The key is that you're taking not only time to focus, but you're also taking that time for to break. Um, you know, for people who have been joining the sessions and kind of going back to back, um, you know, we have not engaged that strategy of giving you that opportunity to take a break to walk around, to stretch your legs. Um, research shows that exercising before and after a big learning event can help you internalize that information, interleaving or switching between one topic to another. Um, that can be another way to give your brain a break from the current topic and shift to something else. Um, so you really want to make that Pomodoro method kind of a switch. When I started, mine was about you know, 10 minutes of really focused on something, switching over to something else for 10, 15 minutes, coming back and kind of doing that. Um, and the key is that you're not trying to multitask in that process. Multitasking is a great way to fail at multiple things simultaneously. Um, so really try to avoid doing any multitasking, really focus on single tasking, because uh, our brains do switch. We can't run two things simultaneously. Anything that's going to take any kind of higher level cognitive thinking um, is going to be something that we have to switch back and forth between. Um, so the practice is taking immediately what you learned and talking to others about it are two of the most important ways in which you can do that. Um, you know, so for example, you could take some of the stuff back to your teams and do a presentation on it of here's the key things that I learned. Here's a book that we're going to pick up and maybe read together. Um, you know, kind of providing that executive summary and then diving deep with folks. Those are all ways that you can really do some of that practice and that activation. Um, one of the most important ways is low stakes testing. So some of the things that um, people do, um, there's Jimbit, 
which is kind of like a Kahoot. Uh, there's Quizlet. Um, there's a number of different things that you can go out there where you can either just download um, the series of questions. Um, there's lots of practice tests like ATD capability model. They have some of those practice questions uh, for their certification exams that you can look at. Those are all great ways for you to do low stakes testing to understand what you do know and what you don't know from an overall perspective. So the three things, um, you know, so was that the um, around activate, practice, and engage? Sorry, you can tell I've been in session since 6 a.m. <laughs> oh, Kahoot. Um, yeah, so it was uh, Kahoot, Quizlet, and the other one is uh, Gimbit or Jimbit. G-I-M-B-I-T. Um, Quizlet is great because people have built a lot of different quizzes out there. So some of them are more um, question-based. Other ones are more, can you do the definitions of items? So there's people who've built a lot out there. So you can just search for something and then pull that down. Um, there's a lot of things that CIPD and ATD do uh, from an overall standpoint that can give you that opportunity to go through and um, Practice addressing, you know, certain questions. I think Morgan talked about change management is an area where a lot of people are low from a skill perspective. So if you're really wanting to get into change management and behavior change, um, you know, you can access resources that would give you the ability to test yourself before you start learning. And as we talked about with Catherine, um, that's a great way to orient yourself to what things you need to learn versus maybe things that you already know. All right, so as we move into the next one, um, so how do you further improve your learning? So when we think about the reflection and effort, um, this is a strategy that's done a lot in the K through 12 space, but is really great for adults. And it's called what squares or square circle triangle. Um, so as you're going through and taking notes on stuff, um, I draw little square circles and triangles on my notes as I'm going through. Um, using the Cornell note taking method is another way to go through and kind of keep your ideas around what am I learning, what questions do I have, and what's the summary of that from a what will I do different. Um, but square, circle, and triangle is just a really simple strategy. So square, what aligns with your thinking? Circle, what do you have questions about? Um, it can be questions about, I just don't understand this content, or it could be something along the lines of, yeah, but I don't see how that would work with our particular group. Triangle is what would you do differently? Um, so this is really taking that step back to say, okay, I've been doing this thing in this particular way. There's a better way that I now know how to do it. How do I start getting into that habituation um, and starting to change that very automatic response that I have to a situation and start walking myself towards that new habit that I want to engage in? Um, effort, as we talked about, is that Goldilocks effect. Um, you know, so if any of you guys used advanced organizers and that kind of stuff in your courses where you, you know, show them a chart of here's the things that we're going to learn. So, for example, I take the prepare model here and I show that to you every single time before we're starting um, that particular section, your brain will start to go, that is familiar. It is not different. I don't need to put any effort into this. I have much more important things to do with my time. So your brain stops paying attention to those things that are very similar. Um, so varying that context is one way that you can go through and increase your effort. Um, you can look at different problems uh, that you might have from a business perspective. So you applied one strategy. Um, it's kind of your go-to way to kind of solve problems you can look at that from a different context using a different strategy. So you've got to put more effort into applying that new strategy. Those are ways that you can really make sure that you think about it from an effort perspective. Um, this is especially important when we think about our learners. We have the tendency to quote unquote, dumb down content. 
Uh, we tend to spoon feed it to our learners from an overall perspective in ways that can be really impactful. You probably won't get a smile sheet that's all that happy, <laughs> at least from the day one content. Um, but research has shown that when you kind of upend that whole process and you put people in the deep end of the pool and you say, okay, you can still touch your toes on the bottom of the pool, but we want you to kind of think about this, pull forward the strategies that you've used, debate with your team members about how you might solve this problem. And then we're going to come back and you know, kind of review that. So that failing forward, uh, that gives you the opportunity to make it effortful um, rather than making it something that you're spoon feeding. Um, you know, if you drop them in the, the deep end and you say, here's a 30 pound ball to try to hold over your head while you're swimming, um, you know, that will be too much effort and your brain also then disengages from that process because you've now triggered that limbic system and your brain is going run, run, run um, because it doesn't distinguish the difference between, um, you know, actual a physical attack and something that you're experiencing mentally. So we've gone through a number of things here. I want to talk a little bit about some of the books, um, you know, that you enjoy from this standpoint and really, um, you know, what you can look to each of these are from a resource perspective. Um, there's lots of stuff out there from an overall perspective. Some of it is good. Um, some of it is not so great, uh, kind of builds on a little bit of hype research, um, you know, so a study that was done maybe didn't have a good P factor to it. Um, from a demographic perspective was a very small um, demographic. And so these books have a lot of research behind them. So Benedict carries how we learn. Um, so this is a lot of how does that process work? Um, that's a great book to kind of give the overarching lay of the land, powerful teaching and make it stick. Um, you know, all of these books are actually favorites of mine, but those two are very synonymous with each other. They're going through that same, how do we make learning sticky? And what are those strategies that you can employ? Um, not a whole lot from a theoretical standpoint in powerful teaching. It's very applicable right off the bat, whereas make it stick kind of goes into the background research and some of the stories from that perspective. Um, design for how people learn. This is by Julie Dirksen. She does a lot of talks about this with uh, the Learning Guild. She has some research out there, but this book is really great for how do we design things. We have strategies that we've always used, but we're not sure if they actually work. She really takes it from the standpoint of here's kind of those proven strategies that you can employ. And then everyone's favorite uh, that you're all familiar with is Mindset by Carol Dweck. Um, what is interesting, and Carol Dweck just posted an article on this week, is she said, I'm really, really frustrated that people have taken my research and positioned it from the standpoint of all or nothing. You're either all fixed mindset or you're all growth mindset. There's no in between. And she said, if you actually step back and look at my research, and if you search her on LinkedIn, uh, her article is out there. Um, she talks about the fact that mindset really exists on a spectrum and there's categories within that spectrum. Um, so if you look or Google, um, growth mindset continuum or growth mindset spectrum, uh, really, what it really points out is there can be areas where you're really comfortable and confident, um, things where you have a very big growth mindset. You love the topic, you love to learn about it, and there can be other areas um, that are more challenging. So things that came up during the last um, career growth series that we did back in September, you can find that on YouTube, was that people were really scared of learning technologies and they were really scared of learning analytics. So, you know, those can be areas where you might have a little bit more of um, a worry from those standpoints. You could keep yourself from learning those topics because you built it up in your head that it's too big, it's too complex. When it comes to analytics, I'm just not good at math. Uh, I failed statistics. I can't do this thing. Or from a learning technology, how would I ever learn this technology? There's, you know, 120 different types of LMSs out there. How would I ever learn that topic? 
Um, you know, so recognizing that there's going to be areas where you have a high growth mindset and other areas where you have a fixed mindset. Um, as they say, the first step is recognizing that you have a problem and then starting to work that problem. Yep, and thank you. There's the uh, YouTube channel link. So I wanna see what questions do you guys have from an overall perspective? Yep, and absolutely, we will be uploading all of those. We have over 90 sessions that are playing out over the four days. Um, so bear with us, it'll take a little bit, um, <laughs> but we will get those up there. Yes. Um... I like that. If professors can learn MS, LMS, then you can. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. When I was talking to Catherine when we were prepping for this session um, earlier, she was like, yeah, I have, I'm teaching at three different universities and they all have different learning management systems and yeah. different presentation systems. And so she was trying to structure her activities to uh, support all of those different environments. And she said, oh, yeah, that's probably the biggest learning that I have is trying to learn the systems. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in the last few months, because all of us as learning professionals have had to go from in-person to web-based, now transferring that some of that content into LMS has become a little more straightforward. I don't know for how the rest of, uh, rest of you are experiencing, but that's been my experience. Yeah, and I think the, you know, the good thing about brain hacks, um, there's a lot of strategies that are out there that are based, you know, are grounded in research and science. Yeah. Um, that's why I provided these books here, because you can Google it and people are all about neurohacking right now, um, brain hacking, those types of things. A lot of that is unproven or yeah. it's based more on the fact that, hey, this sounds right, so obviously it must now be true. Um, you know, so all of these books that I'm recommending, and I didn't put Peak in here, um, but when you look at these books, these are books that people are very much grounded. And if you've ever listened to Julie Dirksen talk, she's always very careful of, here's a new thing that looks like it might work, um, but we don't know that yet. Um, but there's a lot of things in here. Um, you know, some of the stuff that gets covered is how do you make video learning more engaging? Um, you know, so when we talked about the interleaving, uh, research from MIT shows that if you interleave questions with a video, mm -hmm. that will be more sticky than about five or six other ways that you could try. So um, this was research that I did in a previous life. Um, and we really focused on how can we make videos more engaging? Do we tell them that we're going to test them afterwards? Do we tell them that they're going to have to talk to their leaders about it? Do we quiz them before and we quiz them after? Like, we, let's try all of these different strategies. And the one that was most profound and that we went through today is that interleaving. So give me a couple of sections of the video. Mm -hmm. And then ask me questions on it. Then pick yeah. up the second part of the video and ask me questions again. Yeah, yeah. Very bite-sized. Then there's a reflection. And then they get to process their thoughts as well. Yeah. Excellent. I'm just checking if anybody had any other questions. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. We used MEMS. Yes, that's a, yeah. that's a great way. It's typically very unique. Um, it's something that a lot of people are talking about. So by using those types of things, there's actually research and I wish I could remember who did it. Um, but they actually did research into that. There's a lot of social sciences research going on right now. And the beauty of um, using those strategies is you pick something that a lot of people are already talking about. Um, it usually uh, factors into pop culture. So there's going to be some kind of visual piece to it. Um, that's not only, um, you know, what they're seeing, it's also, Hey, you know, game of Thrones, when that was going on, there were tons yeah. of 
that like here comes winter um, <laughs> you immediately not only associated with what it was saying but you were having yeah. conversations with your friends about it you went back to i can't believe they killed my favorite character again um, <laughs> just found a new favorite character um so all of those things you know provided a variety of different things they're a very effective tool um from that standpoint to you know kind of really internalize that because it taps into a lot of those different um ways i like that my graduate accounting professor uses pop culture and it's yeah i I, I've, I've experienced that people try to use all different analogies and trying to relate that to the audience to make it more fun and interesting and to michelle and you know it helps to retain that information as well Yep. And emotion is great. Um, you know, we don't want to make people necessarily crying. <laughs> <laughs> that can be powerful as well. Yes. But we really want to have them care about the thing that they're doing. So if you um, have looked, read the book Hit Refresh um, by Satya Nadella, um, he really talked about, you know, making that very emotional connection for his leaders to the work that we are doing. Like we're not just building software. We're not just giving people cloud solutions. Yeah. Like we're literally in the case of his son, um, we are creating technologies that gives his son the ability to have the quality of life that he wants. Um, you know, so making that very emotional of this is why it's so important to you um, can be a great way. Absolutely. <laughs> Zombie apocalypse. <laughs> um, yeah. And, you know, different different ways to help you learn relating to that. Um, you know, Walking Dead was a, a big yes, thing for a while. It was. I was yeah, the moment I saw that, I thought of Walking Dead. <laughs> yes. So see immediately that trigger of somebody said zombie. What are all the movies that pop to mind from a zombie perspective? Which ones yeah. do I like? All of that piece. Uh, Joy, your question, who is this person? Can you give us a little bit more? Or are you asking Christopher on that one? Yeah, I'm, and that's what I was curious too. <laughs> <laughs> was it like, who is this question of person? <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Who is this? Um, so okay. as we go through, so we just got a couple of minutes. If you guys have questions. Oh, the sun and the software. Yes. Yeah, so that is Satya Nadella. Um, he is the CEO of Microsoft. There's his book, Hit Refresh. Um, so full disclosure. I have two habits. Uh, one is buying books and the other one is reading. They don't always sync up with one another. <laughs> so I've got quite the club. Same here. Same. Um, I, I, I need to get that habituation of you buy, you read. Read yeah. and then don't buy the next one till you finish reading. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so a little bit this afternoon, if you haven't gone through um, the previous two days, today is going to be a little bit of a different um, play. Um, so if you think about, you know, uh, physical conferences you went to where we had an expo hall, uh, we will have some of that there um this afternoon so these are you know companies people who have donated their time who are really invested in making you successful as an l d talent od person talent acquisition uh pick your discipline we tend to like to slice and dice our disciplines a little bit more than maybe we should um but we will have booths out there that you can go and visit to learn more uh, there will be resources out there that you can uh, grab if you missed them um, as we were talking through earlier from uh, Andy Storch's session on own your career, own your life, um, this is a great opportunity for you to do some personal branding. So sharing out the insights um, that you're gleaning as you go through is a really useful way. It makes it generative, so it puts it into your own language. Um, you're teaching others about what you learned and having conversations about it. Um, you're activating that from an overall perspective and you're just kind of building those neural pathways. Absolutely. Yeah, and Janet, always take advantage, uh, do Google of, uh, you know, sometimes the Get Abstract will give away free summaries uh, to kind of tempt you so you could go out there and grab a free summary. Um, Kindle is great. So if you go to the Kindle store on Amazon, um, sometimes you can find on Kindle Unlimited free summaries of a lot of the books out there, um, which is great. Um, I'm just putting on the Twitter hashtag. Oh yeah, follow the second one, not ignore the first. <laughs> <laughs>
So it's at LD Cares one. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. And so after this, um, we do transition over to the lounge area. Um, so you can go over there, set up again like an expo hall. You can pop into any table that you want to and have conversations with others. If you don't want to pick a table, hit the speed dating button at the top and it will automatically match you with someone to have a conversation. Or you can kind of peek through the tables, find one that's interesting around one of the subjects that you're interested in. Yeah. Um, but would definitely recommend going over there because again, that's a really good brain hack because yeah. you're discussing and pulling forward. What was it that I learned from today or how it relates to something you learned over the last two days? Um, those are really great ways to solidify the knowledge. And uh, the question is whether you'll be at the table, Michelle. <laughs> I can join a table for 15 minutes and then I got to go pick up my daughter from school. So happy yeah. to join. <laughs> I will give you guys, because an important part that I did not cover in terms of brain hacks is exercise, nutrition, and sleep. So make sure oh. that you're taking that time to stretch your legs, get a drink of water. Um, our brain uses 27% of the glucose uh, that we take in during the day. So if you haven't had any snacks or taken that time to refuel, uh, your body's probably running a little bit low on that glucose. Uh, so take time to do that. Um, stretching your legs and walking is a great way to kind of give your brain not only that chance to think about and start internalizing that information, but do some of that as well. Absolutely. So thank you all very much for joining and we'll see you in the lounge. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Michelle. Yes, thank you.